Didn't see you come in there. Right uh, there. We're, we're busy doing science. Well, uh, today we are going deep into our IPA process. We're gonna show you how to not only brew the perfect IPA, but show that it is possible to bottle condition an IPA made with 16 ounces of hops. The scientific approach to things is um, trial and error. So I hypothesize that this one is going to turn out just right. <laughs> when it comes to building this recipe, we took a few things into consideration. Uh, we went with mostly cashmere hops with some citra and sabro. When we were choosing the hops too, I mean obviously we were trying to get something that was very New England focused, so cashmere, it's used in a lot of the newer New England IPAs. Citra, phenomenal hop, great juice characteristic. And then sabro. Now sabro is an interesting hop. You can get coconut flavors, you can get tropical flavors. If you go too heavy on it, supposedly it tends toward cedar. And of course we also wanted a complimentary yeast. We wanted something that had juicy tropical flavors, which is why we went with Imperial A24 Dry Hop Yeast. The first order of business is our water chemistry. Now water chemistry is pretty easy as you can see. I've got a few calculations on the board here, but uh, let me break it on down for you. Yeah. When it comes to an IPA, you want to pay attention to just pretty much three things. pH, you want it to be maybe the 5.2, 5.3 range. Then you also want to pay attention to the sulfate and chloride content. Now, when doing a West Coast IPA, you go for a higher sulfate content. For a New England IPA, oftentimes you go for a higher chloride content. We do try to keep our calcium levels under 100 parts per million. If there's too much calcium in the beer, do you ever get the, the chalky taste in certain IPAs? Yeah. So I like to keep Not it. ours, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I like to keep the, uh, the chemistry sort of as a background note. I don't want you to be tasting the actual minerals. I want it just to influence the mouthfeel, the dryness. Our grain bill. Yes. We've started doing a mix of Pilsner malt and Golden Promise. For the mash on this one, uh, we went with a hot curt smash.
well, when we designed this recipe, uh, you know, we were trying to make the ultimate New England IPA, just like a total juice bomb, tropical. But according to my notes here, I do not believe that we brewed this. I believe it was actually the oh, cool no. guys. Oh no. thought it would be a good idea to bottle the Der Zwerg beer during this hop stand and chilling process. This has been a proven calamitous decision multiple occasions. Probably the worst decision that the cool guys could have made was bottling that day. Yeah, especially since uh, the cool guys forgot their racking cane from the little plastic fermenter. Okay. So maybe bottling on the same day as brewing isn't a good idea, okay? So Whatever. maybe forgetting the racking cane isn't a good idea. Whatever. Mama, you're a handful. I drink it. chilling process. I wrote down in the recipe a 30 minute steep. <laughs> Who knows how long we steeped these hops. I had to go to the homebrew store, buy a racking cane, come back, then transfer the, uh, the beer. So, Also, that was the second appearance at the homebrew store that day. Maybe we forgot the yeast at the store. Who cares? Maybe we had to go get it during the mash. We got it. We got it. I think the cool guys took over for the uh, for the night at that point. Yeah, the cool guys decided we lost the light, so we, we couldn't continue cleaning. <laughs> so a certain cool guy decided, well, he wasn't gonna go home because he was going to instead drink a lot of beer <laughs> and clean up in the morning. And another cool guy had purchased some triple home styles by Bearded Iris. So the cool guys drank some double home style, then some triple home style, and played video games and passed out on the couch. Yep. And did not did not pitch the yeast. <laughs> so maybe leaving the yeast out overnight isn't a good idea. It works. Theoretically this could have been good. Theoretically, if the cool guys could have kept it together. Yeah, I mean, I woke up early, remembered we didn't pitch the yeast. I sanitized it and pitched it and everything turned out good. So I don't know what the smart guys are going on about. So like the smart guys are a bunch of uh, lame guys. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. In 
inside of every one of us, there are two wolves. A cool wolf and a smart wolf. <laughs> and the, the smart wolf always loses. <laughs> But the beer didn't get ruined, that's a good thing. Hey man, look at this black beer. Oh. Man, I think I'll finally be able to see it. So, uh, moving on to our dry hopping process. Resuming uh, with smart guys. We don't typically do a double dry hop. We don't do a, a bio-transformation dry hop because we do a, a massive whirlpool. I do think that the bio transformation dry hop is overrated, especially if you already do a whirlpool. Diminishing returns for sure. Um, especially with our schedule, we don't have a way of dumping the hops, so they would just end up sitting in the fermenter for longer than we really want. It tends to get a little, a little hop burn, a little grassiness picked up from that long contact time. So we just do one massive uh, final dry hop. So when dry hopping, you want to do it without the presence of yeast. Say if you do like an all early dry hop, when the yeast flocks out, it will bind to those hop oils and drag them down. So you'll get less intense hop flavor. So, you know, if you were using a conical or something, you could actually dump the yeast and then dry hop. Uh, we don't have a conical bottom on there. So we just kind of wait for the yeast to be done fermenting, fall down. You can do a soft crash if you want to, or we just kind of use time and then we dry hop. The trick to dry hopping is also limiting oxygen exposure. One of the reasons we bought the Spike Flex fermenter was because it was pressure capable, had the, the top port that you could open while also connected to CO2 and blowing in the, the gas through the, uh, the gas post, keeping the oxygen out. There is a myth of the CO2 blanket uh, that does not exist. You can't just like, pump CO2 in something and then just open it up and expect that the oxygen won't get in. There is gas mixing that happens here. So that's why we constantly pump the CO2 through during a short time that we have the top port open. Now, before we bought the fancy fermenter, we just had PET carboys, but they have a nice small opening. You could just run a hose of CO2 into the opening while you dump the hops. Sparge it. Yeah. One of the cool things about the carboy caps is there's little, there's two posts. So you could just purge the headspace with your CO2 after you connect it, which is what we used to do. Turned out great. So. Yeah, it really does. I mean, we've got, the one we have now is a significant upgrade, but at the same time. Yeah, you don't, you don't really need fancy expensive equipment. You just have to be smart about it. <laughs> That is one great big pile of A lot of this knowledge is coming from uh, some books, such as Scott Janish's The New IPA, as well as his blog posts. Um, also, a shout out to Homebrew Talk for their 300 plus page thread <laughs> on Northeast IPAs that I have read pretty much all of. Uh, Viewers of the channel might notice that we like to bottle condition our beers, despite the fact that I make mock-up cans for <laughs> for our videos. That's just because it's an interesting way of, you know, showcasing the artwork. So we bottle conditioned ever since we started, and for many years, we made horribly oxidized IPAs. At the time, we didn't know it because uh, good IPAs didn't exist in Tennessee at the time. <laughs> So I started doing a few things. We started purging the headspace of the fermenter when we were dry hopping. But most importantly, we started purging the headspace of the bottles uh, right before we capped it. And I read there is a Bell study that only about 33% of the oxygen in the headspace can be consumed by the yeast. So then you've still got two thirds of that headspace is oxygen. When you have a heavily dry hopped beer, 
it oxidizes very quickly. You lose all that hot flavor and they can turn dark, start tasting like sort of sherry flavors, candy flavors, uh, or cardboard. But <laughs> with one simple trick where we low tech took the hose from, <laughs> from yeah. the bottle. So I, I would, I would fill the bottles from a bottling bucket that we sort of purge with CO2, but you know, the CO2 blanket doesn't exist. So we just, you know, transfer it, put it in a bottling bucket, fill it with a bottling wand. I would hand it to you. You would have to uh, purge it with the, the hose, then, then quickly yeah, cap it, yeah. which worked great. It wasn't terribly convenient, but it worked yeah. amazingly. So when we were upgrading our system, we went with the Flex Plus, which was pressure capable, and we could just bottle directly out of the fermenter. What our process became is we would get Domino Dots sugar cubes. Rest in peace. Yeah, more on that <laughs> later. Uh, prime it with a single Domino Dot, the 198 count, which is like 2.5-ish grams, and then bottle directly from the fermenter with the Blickman beer gun, which solved the problem of having to do that annoying hose thing because yeah. I could hook it up and I could fill at the same time and purge. So each bottle is purged before filling, filled, and then headspace is purged. Put the cap on, hand it off to Chad, and uh, caps it. Yeah, really that's one of, the, I think, the biggest market improvement in our beer flavor was starting to do the CO2. Domino sugar discontinued the 198 count domino dots, which were the perfect size for fitting in a bottle and perfect carb level. Um, so all that's left is the 126 count, which is three and a half grams, which even if you use a larger bottle than a 12 ounce, uh, does not fit in the neck of the bottle. Yeah. So we went with some Brewer's Best carb drops and they work just fine. They're just more expensive. So RIP domino dots. Like two bucks for what three batches of beer, pretty much. Maybe even four. Yeah. It's 198. So. Yeah, and then now it's what eight bucks or something ridiculous. So it's for... like five bucks for one batch of beer. So. Yeah. Whatever. I guess we'll get over it. Uh... Uh, we do have a sort of hazy, light gold color. Very tropical aroma. Yeah, kind of like pineapple. Coconut. Yeah, very pina colada-esque. Just tropical, yeah. smoothie. Yeah, the flavor too. I mean, it's just pina coladas, man. I don't know if you guys ever heard this song. I think it might be called The Scape, but really, Everyone knows it's the Pina Colada song. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's what I know it as. I love Pina Coladas. Do I you also, like Pina Coladas? I, hold on a second. I also like getting caught in the rain. Do you like making love at midnight? Till midnight 01. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, um, it took a minute to sort of meld perfectly. I did think on the initial taste that the yeast was a little bit too forward. It was very very estery, very tropical. It almost overpowered the hops a little bit. It was yeah. a little too yeast forward. But now the sabro has come through and there's like this huge coconut note. The sabro is by far the most predominant hop flavor in this one. I mean, it meshes well with the citra and the, the cashmere to where it's very much like a summer cocktail, um, but it's also predominantly coconut oriented, I think, which is where that Sabro is uh, shining through big time. Yeah, I feel like it's big pineapple from the yeast, a lot of coconut from the Sabro. I feel like the Citra just kind of emphasizes the juicy fruit mm -hmm. flavors. It's not predominant. It kind of just elevates that cashmere into a sort of soft tropical, uh, you know, almost smoothie-esque. Yeah. Because we had brewed, uh, well, actually, the cool guys brewed that cashmere pilsner a while back, and you got that just soft, tropical, delicate flavor yeah. from it. Um, and I think that carries through here. I mean, mm -hmm. we did use a lot of cashmere in here, but uh, just that little bit of sabro in there 
gives that coconut note. The brew day was far from smooth, but the beer certainly is. <laughs> Like and subscribe for more cool guys. Click the notification bell, ding dong, whatever. Comment, do all those things. So more people watch my videos, I spend a lot of time on. I can't figure out computers. <laughs> Follow me on Instagram at hopheadbanger, where I pretend to be a metalhead, which I am, but follow me on Instagram at the Naboo Crew. There's a lot of Taylor Swift on my Instagram. Unblock me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be all up in your DMs. <laughs> As Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> I am not a cool guy. You know, I've been looking through my YouTube analytics, and did you know that only 69% of you are subscribed? 69? This is a family family <laughs> show, man. <laughs> yeah, man. This guy likes that. Yeah, this guy. This guy knows what's up. Best character in Star Wars, bar none. Man, I hope they bring him back for the Mandalorian. Man, I thought that Rey was a Binks. That would have been, that would have been the best ending. Yeah. What's the name? Rey. Rey who? Missy called Rey Rey Binks. <laughs> Boom! Dab, dab on, on them droidicas. Dab on them. Dab on them. <laughs>